He was a perverse cross-dressing exhibitionist who had an incestuous relationship with his mother and married his stepsister. He murdered members of his own family in fits of jealous rage. His cruelty, violence and grotesque appetite for self-indulgence brought the Roman Empire to the brink of financial and political ruin. And he viciously persecuted the Christians. They would remember him as the ultimate embodiment of evil. The Antichrist. Nero was born on the 15th of December 37 AD in Antium. His father, Gnaeus, was from an old Roman aristocratic family. He was a cruel, hard-drinking man who once ran over a child in his chariot for pleasure. Gnaeus died when Nero was three years old. For the first 20 years of his life, Nero would be dominated by his mother, Agrippina. She was a sister of the Emperor Caligula. She was ambitious, amoral, and a born survivor. Nero's mother was a very strong-minded woman. The Roman sources like to say that she behaved like a man, by which they mean that she understood politics and tried to wield political power. She was absolutely determined that her son was going to become emperor, and she didn't care how many people she had to walk over in order to achieve it. When the emperor Claudius was widowed, Agrippina embarked on a campaign of seduction. Within a short time, she had married him, and began to work relentlessly on the advancement of her son. When Nero was 13, she persuaded Claudius to adopt him, and when he was 16, she engineered his marriage to the emperor's daughter Octavia, Nero's stepsister. While Nero's fortunes rose, the position of Claudius's natural son Britannicus was becoming increasingly difficult. Nero was four years older, which meant he took official precedence over his stepbrother. As Nero took on more and more duties, Britannicus was sidelined. In 54 AD, Agrippina decided the time was right to make a bid to put Nero into power. According to the Roman historian Tacitus, only one obstacle remained, the aging Emperor Claudius. Agrippina had long decided on murder. Now she saw her opportunity. Her agents were ready. The poison was administered by the eunuch Halotus. It was sprinkled on a particularly succulent mushroom. Claudius's weakness for cooked mushrooms brought about his death on the 11th of October, 54 AD. The next day, the Praetorian Guard declared Nero emperor. At the age of 17, he had become ruler of the biggest empire the world had ever seen. But while the Romans celebrated their new boy emperor in the streets, Nero was already showing a disturbing tendency towards violence. The year was a time of peace abroad, but disgusting excess by Nero in Rome. Disguised as a slave, he ranged the streets, brothels and taverns with his friends who pilfered goods from shops and assaulted wayfarers. When it became known that the waylayer was the emperor, attacks on distinguished men and women multiplied. For since disorderliness was tolerated, pseudo-Neros mobilized gangs and behaved similarly, with impunity. Rome by night came to resemble a conquered city. Nero's growing appetite for violence would soon find a target closer to home. Nero was insecure because he knew that Britannicus was actually the natural son of the previous emperor and that he had been adopted and some people thought that Claudius had been manipulated into adopting him. Nero decided to murder his rival, but according to his first century biographer Suetonius, he needed a method that would not arouse suspicion. To achieve this, he would need help. Against Britannicus, he employed poison, no less because of the competition he posed in singing. He had a much pleasanter voice than through fear that one day he would prevail in public favour. He obtained it from a certain Lacusta, who was an expert poisoner. He gave orders that the substance be brought to the dining room and given to Britannicus. When Britannicus collapsed, Nero rewarded Lacusta with immunity from prosecution and an ample estate. He even sent her pupils. 
With Britannicus out of the way, Nero and his mother reigned with impunity. They passed laws and appeared on Roman currency together, with Agrippina acting as the young emperor's self-styled regent. She was determined to maintain absolute control of her son, and according to Tacitus, she was prepared to go to any length to do it. According to one author, Cluvius Rufus, Agrippina's passion to retain power carried her so far that at midday, the time when food and drink were beginning to raise Nero's temperature, she several times appeared before her inebriated son, all decked out and ready for incest. Their companions observed sensual kisses and evilly suggestive caresses. His mother had been the architect of his rise, and she wanted him to remember it all the time. And initially, of course, he was prepared to be grateful, but he got tired of it and decided that the only cure was to get rid of her. As Nero's thoughts turned from devotion to murder, he hatched a bizarre plan. He ordered the construction of a booby-trapped boat designed to fall apart when under sail. When the boat was completed, he invited Agrippina to join him at the resort town of Baiae for a festival. After a pleasant evening together, Nero kissed his mother farewell and left by land, while Agrippina left by sea. Midway across the bay, concealed lead weights crashed through the boat's roof and it began to sink. But the injured Agrippina managed to swim to safety. When Nero heard his mother had survived, he was terrified of what she might do and immediately dispatched assassins to her villa. The murderers closed round Agrippina. First, the captain hit her on the head with a truncheon. Then, as the lieutenant was drawing his sword, she cried out, strike here, pointing to her womb. Nero's rise to power had cost the lives of his mother, his stepbrother, and his adoptive father. Now, with absolute control of the empire, Nero would indulge his appetites for cruelty and self-indulgence to the full. The role of the Roman emperors was to protect Roman citizens and secure the empire's borders by force. Nero had little interest in the affairs of state he preferred to indulge himself in lavish banquets where he would perform his own compositions to his friends. As the empire began to go into decline, Nero's response was to perform before his people on stage. In his performances, Nero liked to play the parts of both men and women. The aristocrats of the empire were outraged. It was as if the revered traditions of the emperors were being dragged in the mud before their very eyes. When he was singing, it was not permitted to leave the theater even for the most pressing of reasons. Thus it is alleged that women gave birth during his shows, and many who were tired of listening and applauding when the entrance gates were closed, either jumped furtively off the wall or else pretended to be dead and were carried out for burial. Nero's thin, husky voice would be heard on the stages of Naples, Greece and Rome, but whatever the audience felt about his performances, his compositions were always met with applause. He had some young men who were called equites, and these followed him around and applauded him, and then one day he was told that in Alexandria there was a tradition of actually training people to clap, and he thought it was a wonderful idea, so he had his clack trained to do this, but apparently he was so pleased with the effect that he couldn't pass it up. While Nero's performances exposed him to public ridicule, his private behavior was becoming increasingly salacious. He prostituted his own body to such a degree that when virtually every part of his body had been employed in filthy lusts, he devised a new and unprecedented practice as a kind of game, 
in which, disguised in the pelt of a wild animal, he would rush out of a den and attack the private parts of men and women who had been attached to stakes. It was becoming clear that Nero's appetite for self-indulgence was out of control. The emperor was turning into a monster. As a ruler, the most serious things he does is to uh, exploit the empire and to take its resources for his own purposes, uh, and by doing so, to actually endanger the safety and security of his subjects. In 60 AD, on the edge of the empire, in a place called Britain, Roman tax collectors brutally robbed the queen of a local tribe. She was flogged, and her daughters were raped. It was a big mistake. Queen Bodicea incited her people, the Iceni, to revolt. In a lightning campaign across southern Britain, they destroyed Colchester, London and St Albans, killing the Roman inhabitants. In Rome, Nero panicked and made plans to evacuate the island forever. But his generals were prepared to stand firm and fight for the Roman Empire. The first great battle of Britain took place at an unknown location in central England. The 10,000 legionnaires of General Paulinus made a desperate stand against an enemy that outnumbered them more than 20 to 1. Against all odds, the legionnaires carried the day. Bodicea poisoned herself. Nero's empire was safe for now. In Rome, Nero's behavior was becoming even more cruel and more eccentric. In AD 62, he had his first wife, Octavia, murdered so he could marry his mistress, Poppea. Nero would later kick the pregnant Poppea to death when she scolded him for coming home late after a chariot race. It was a murderous act that Nero deeply regretted. In a fit of remorse, he took a boy called Sporus, who reminded him of Poppea. The boy was castrated, dressed, and made up to look like the dead empress, and married to Nero in an extravagant ceremony. In AD 64, a great fire ravaged the center of Rome for six days. It was the biggest urban fire the ancient world had seen and would not be equaled in its destruction until the fires of Dresden in the Second World War. Nero was away from Rome at the time. It's unlikely that he fiddled while his city burned, but many believed the emperor had started the fire. Nobody dared fight the flames. Attempts to do so were prevented by menacing gangs. Torches too were openly thrown in by men crying that they acted on orders. The great Roman fire left hundreds of thousands destitute and the Roman economy in such a crisis that the currency had to be devalued. One man alone seemed to benefit from the carnage. The fact was a lot of land became available because a lot of houses were burned down and the emperor took advantage of this in order to build this palace and he started building it in various quarters of the city simultaneously so the impression that he was taking over the city uh, and also the sufferings of the individuals who lost their property uh, created a very bad impression Nero cleared an area the size of London's Hyde Park in the center of Rome here he built a new sprawling palace complex called the Golden House after the plates of gold which were said to cover its ceilings and walls. It contained an enormous lake and expansive grounds which were populated with all manner of exotic animals. The banqueting halls had coppered ceilings fitted with panels of ivory which would revolve, scattering flowers and pipes which would spray perfume on those beneath. The principal banqueting chamber had a dome which revolved continuously both day and night like the world itself. When the house was brought to completion in this style, and he dedicated it, he said nothing more to indicate his approval than to declare he had at last begun to live like a human being. It is 
as it were, Nero's great statement in the city of Rome. And remember that in front of it, at this gate, is this enormous, colossal statue of the sun, but with the features of the emperor. The purpose of the Golden Palace? To lord and praise the name of the great man. It becomes uh, yet one further reason to condemn him after his fall. In Rome, the word on the streets was that Nero had ordered the fire so he could build his enormous palace. It was a rumour that would not go away. To regain the trust of his people, the emperor needed a scapegoat. He hit on the idea that anybody would believe anything of the Christians, uh, and also that there was a marvellous way of getting them to confess, because everybody knew that if you were a Christian, you wouldn't deny your Christianity. So if you announced that the Christians started the fire, anyone who confessed to their Christianity was assumed to have confessed to arson. It's clear that Nero treated the Christians with particular cruelty and barbarity. Tacitus tells us that he had them rounded up, he had them dressed in animal skins and attacked by dogs, he had some crucified, and he also had many burned. In the evening, he lined up his garden with Christians as human torches. Nero's attack on the Christians would be the first persecution of Christianity under the Roman Empire. It's believed both the disciple Peter and the apostle Paul were tortured and killed during Nero's reign. In the Bible's book of Revelations, John describes the end of the world and warns of a beast with two horns. Was it Nero that he had in mind? Here is wisdom. Let him that hath understanding count the number of the beast, for it is the number of a man, and his number is six hundred, three score and six. In languages such as Greek and Hebrew, there was no separate set of numbers. Numbers were represented by the letters of the alphabet. When the name Nero Caesar is transliterated from the Greek, Nero and Kaiser, into the Hebrew, that is to say when the Greek characters of the name are replaced by Hebrew characters, then the numerical value of the name in Hebrew comes to 666. So as far as the church is concerned, there's no goodness in Nero. He is an antichrist figure. He is an embodiment of evil. In a bid to remove any potential rivals, Nero had systematically murdered every member of his family. When finally a major plot was hatched against him in 65 AD, it was masterminded by his friend, the Senator Piso. The conspirators included senators, officers of the Imperial Guard, and even Nero's tutor and mentor, Seneca. The fatal blow was to be struck while Nero attended the Circus Maximus, Rome's vast chariot arena, during the Feast of Ceres. But the conspiracy was betrayed by a slave. One after the other, the conspirators were rounded up and put to death by Nero's execution squad. Piso was lucky. He was allowed to commit suicide by cutting his wrists. After his narrow escape, Nero began to see enemies everywhere. Each year, he murdered more and more senators, aristocrats, and army officers. The final death toll would never be known. He comes to distrust those who are very competent. And on the other hand, he's afraid of them because he knows that they don't respect him. By the end of the reign, he's actually putting them to death. One of the reasons for the big rebellions, I think, is that all those people in charge of legions think that their days are numbered. 68 AD would be known as the year of the Great Rebellions. In March, Governor Vindex raised an army of 100,000 against the Emperor in Gaul. They were butchered by Nero's legions. But at the same time, a more serious rebellion was brewing in northern Spain, headed by the Governor Galba. In Rome, Galba's agents took control of Nero's palace guard. When they refused to take his orders, 
Nero knew his days as emperor were over. Nero was completely paralyzed. He was terrified that the armies had turned against him. He didn't trust anybody, and in the end, he decided to flee Rome and give it up. But it was this terror inspired by the awareness that he had made so many enemies. Nero fled some miles outside the city to the countryside villa of one of his ex-slaves. He made plans to adopt a new identity as a traveling musician. But Galba's agents had convinced the Senate to declare him a public enemy and issue orders for his arrest and execution. Realizing there was no escape, Nero snatched up two daggers, which he had brought with him, and tried the blade of each. At that moment, some horsemen drew near under orders to bring him back living. Aware of this, he hesitantly said, the thunder of swift-footed horses echoes round my ears. He then drove the dagger into his throat with the help of his secretary, Epaphroditus. Nero was dead, but for the Roman people, the nightmare would continue. In the year following his death, the empire would be ravaged by civil war. It would be called the Year of the Four Emperors. First, Galba, murdered after seven months in office. Then the Emperor Otho, driven to commit suicide three months later. Followed by Vitellius, whose short reign would end when he was tortured to death by the new Emperor Vespasian. Later emperors would try to eradicate the memory of Nero. They carved their own faces onto Nero's old statues and tore down his golden house, building baths over the ruins. But the legend of Nero would not die. For years after his death, there were wild rumors that Nero had somehow survived. The provinces were alive with sightings of men claiming to be the Roman emperor who played the lyre. An enormous arena was built obliterating the great lake that once reflected Nero's palace. The arena was called the Amphitheatre of Titus. But everyone calls it the Colosseum because once a colossal statue of Nero stood there and no one could forget the sun god emperor Nero.